Hello everyone, so welcome to another video and today I want to talk a little more in depth about Python's multi-threading and multi-processing. By a little more in depth, I really mean that I am not going to talk about the syntax. Um, I am not going to talk about the syntax and I will be using something called the process pool executor in the examples. Um, it, it's, it's good if you have some idea of these concepts already. Um, there are tons of YouTube videos out there who that, that teach that teach you how to write these things in Python. It's pretty simple. However, um, the examples in those um, videos are often too simple, too naive, right? Um, which is not really the case in real life. Um, in real life, you are constantly dealing with crazy data sets. We are constantly dealing with um, many other issues. Okay, so um, so that is the first point. And then I, I do have, uh, if you want to learn about the syntax of multiprocessing and multi-threading in Python, here is a very good video with some good examples. Um, So uh, I'll put this in description too, so don't worry about that. And um, again, if you want technical stuff, I'm going to talk a little, I'm going to use some technical terms and introduce some technical, um, introduce some technical stuff in Python. However, I'm not really going to go into the implementation of how you um, write code for multi-threading or how you write code to do multiprocessing. I'm not going that direction because that's a totally different topic. I'm just going to I'm going to use some technical term. I'm going to introduce some technical knowledge, but I think I will be focus. I, I think um, it, this video is more about an intuitive understanding of what these things are and what what are some limitations of these things in Python. And I'm not going to talk about async because, um, in my opinion, async is not really the same thing. It's slightly different. Um, it's not really. It's kind of multi -process. It's kind of multi threading, but it's not really. Uh, so I'm not really going to talk about async. Async should be its own different world. Okay. So with that, um, let me first talk about multi threading and. If you've watched my previous videos, you might have learned something called a global interpreter lock. What is it? Well, it's essentially something at the very back end of Python. And if you have a Python process that you want to run, it has to acquire the global interpreter lock first. OK. <laughs> What does that mean? Well, it means that if you have a thread, a Python thread that is running, it has this global interpreter lock. And if you have another thread, the other thread has to wait until the first thread release, releases the global interpreter lock before it can run. So, what does this mean? Well, this means that you may have, you might have launched many threads but they're actually not happening in parallel. They're actually still happening in a linear way. And this is a typo. <laughs> it's not that important. Okay, they're still happening in a linear way. So that is a problem with Python's multi-threading. Well, you can certainly do that, but this is a big problem. So um, to explain this graphically, let's say we have um, our main thread here, um, let's say this is our main, right? And um, main runs for a while, and at some point it launches two threads, right? And let's say the first thread is instanced first, right? The first thread is created first. And then, because of this, the first thread has to acquire the global interpreter lock. By circle A, I mean acquire this um, global interpreter lock. And that means thread 2 cannot run. 
by this I mean it's wait it's waiting so threat 2 has to wait wait until when wait until the thread 1 releases the global interpreter lock so thread 1 here releases this lock and now thread 2 can come in and say okay I am going to acquire the lock now and now thread 2 runs and blah 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 thread 2 at some point will finish at that point our program will finish so this is a graphical representation of what's happening here and we can immediately see that um, there's a problem, right? There's a problem with this model. There's a problem um, once we require threads to acquire the global interpreter lock. So how do we get around this? Well, the, the Python people are not stupid. They definitely know about this issue. And well, there were some attempts to remove the global interpreter lock from Python, but those were not so successful. So um, today, the most common way um, to work around the global interpreter lock um, is actually to live with it. <laughs> uh, but how, well, it's not really a good answer. Um, but remember, here's a catch. Every Python thread is every Python thread needs th this global interpreter lock to run. It means that, okay, if I am running Python, but at some point I'm calling, like this is a function, but the function is actually calling some C code. Then we can actually release the global interpreter lock at this step. That means, actually, we can still get some parallelism in Python. As long as we are um, calling functions that are running in a different language, and um, in the meantime, because, it's the f because the function is running in a different language, we can release this lock and let the other threads run. And it turns out that quite a few Python built-in functions are, are actually calling C functions. And uh, we all know that uh, very common packages like NumPy, it's, it's running C. So we can actually use Python's multi-threading um, to do some, um, you know, parallel stuff. But it's again not completely parallel. It's just some level of parallel. It's only when we are calling the function, and there are some technical detail uh, that I'm not very that I don't really understand but um, the, the general idea is that if you are calling something that, that is not written in Python then you can release the global interpreter lock and thus you can let other threads run, other Python threads run. So graphically what is happening is that um, my thread, let's say again the first thread runs and at this point it passes, it becomes, it's, it's just a C call and it's, it's actually running C now. Then thread 2 has to wait until this point, um, at this point thread 1 releases the lock and at this point thread 2 can acquire the lock and run the Python part and at this point, uh, let's say the C call takes some time and at, at this point the C code runs for in the second thread and um, this is the end of end of thread one, and this is the end of thread two, and this is will be this will be the end of the program. So this is a graphical representation of um, this idea. Okay. So how is data shared among threads? Well, um, it is very common that um, we say we have four threads, but um, we are sharing some data. Like every thread is um, doing some lookup on this data. Well, threads are not processes. So in fact, everything is happening in one Python progress. Oh, sorry, process in one Python process. So this is just one Python that is running. It has one global interpreter lock because it is one Python that is running. 
So, I mean, that this data is just some some memory somewhere in the heap, and every thread can access this memory as long as they are in the same scope, right? So this is how threads share data. Okay, so what are some common mistakes when when we are using multi-threading, right? Um, the most common one is the naive belief that it will make your code faster. It's not. It's not always the case. Just think about it. Whenever you are spawning a thread, you're doing some work, right? Like creating the thread is not instant. It requires some thing to happen in the back end. So spawning thread is already, it takes some time. And because of issues like this, I mean, you don't know if your code is really written in C or not, right? So some level of parallel computing might happen, but it's not always completely parallel. And another common mistake is that we change the shared object in one thread in ways that will cause other threads to crash or yield bad results. This is actually not um, not a Python problem. This is a generally this is just a multi-threading problem in any language. Let's just imagine that um, in thread one, after some very crazy stuff, we we freed this data. I mean, there's nothing stopping you from freeing this memory. I mean you get a pointer to this and then you can say okay free this I mean in Python you can say del this nothing stops you from doing that but the other threads might still need to access that and now we get a null pointer right now we get now we now this piece of data is actually like we don't know what exactly it is now it's not what you want and that will cause the the other threads to crash that this is just a very like uh, simple example obviously in real life um, it gets more complicated it's not that easy to find the bug in um, in real life when you're trying when you're writing multi-threaded code okay and uh, another common mistake is to launch way too many threads um, so like w what are the what are the cases when multi-threading is useful, right? I mean, when you are doing, when you're downloading stuff, downloading stuff, right? I mean, I can download a lot of, a lot of pictures at the same time, right? And, and I can maybe, I, I, I'm just hitting the database, I'm getting some small piece of data back. Sure, then, of course, you can do this in parallel. And, uh, well, however, um, if it's on-prem, if you're hitting on-prem, like your company's own stuff, you might be able to uh, launch multiple threads, but if you're using services that Amazon provides, I mean, for example, DynamoDB, or um, other services that is running on other companies' machines, then they might, um, they might have these um, read limits per second. So if you are actually launching way too many threads, I mean, th there's a good reason for that. I mean, if you are just launching like a lot of lots of lots of threads and then hit their server, I mean, their server may crash because you are just sending too many requests. Um, but then Amazon, I mean, even if you pay them for the service, they are still not letting you use the I mean, they they still have this limit even though you're paying and uh, whatever I'm so th there might be such things as like read limits and whenever you have an error that that is because you've reached the read limit the error actually will waste you a lot of time why because you won't realize it's an error because the threads are still being sent it's just that the server refuses to give anything back, right? The server might wait a few seconds and then as long, uh, uh, 
as soon as the server reopens its gate, your threads are going to go in and get more data and then you will hit the maximum, you might hit the limit again. It really depends on how the server implements this limit. So th this error will waste you a lot of time in many cases. Like you won't realize you have this problem. I mean, sometimes one thread might re return early with this with some sort of an error message, um, but that won't won't be immediately displayed. Um, you won't be immediately notified of this error. Sometimes there there are lots of reasons. Okay. So next. Um, what is this? Uh, I think I just this is, this is just a duplicate. Uh, I'm not going to use this. Okay, so next I'm going to talk about multiprocessing. Okay. So I mentioned earlier that one Python has only one global interpreter lock. Then why don't we create many Python, right? My, many Python processes. Now each Python process will still have a global interpreter lock, but I mean we can let each process run the same t run many tasks at the same time, can't we? Right? I mean we can certainly open. I mean like we can open ten um, Word documents. We can have ten di different Word documents open at the same time, and then you know just tap through each document and edit each one. It's 10 programs that are running, right? Why can't we do that? Well, I mean, sure, you can, you can. And seriatically, this kind of bypasses the global interpreter lock. Like we are not dealing with one global interpreter locks anymore. We are dealing with many global interpreter locks because we have many Python processes. So seriatically, yes, this is, this sounds like a good solution. But, well, what are what is the cost? Like previously, we were just launching a thread, which can be which can be pretty thin, right? Which can be pretty slim. But now we are launching many Pythons, right? So, what is happening, right? What is happening? We have one Python that is running here. It acquires some space in your memory, but then we are launching many many other Pythons. So we are not initializing threads anymore. We are initializing Pythons. <laughs> so this actually turns out to be more expensive. This turns out to be way more expensive than threads. So it's not always um, a good idea to um, use multiprocessing. And now, because, oh, why did I erase that? Because we have m multiple Pythons, right? They are essentially their own program. How do they commute with each other? How, how do they communicate with, e with each other? How is data being shared? If we actually need some shared data between all the processes. And lastly, right, we already, I mean, Python is not a memory efficient language. Um, you can just create an empty class and then, uh, and then you can take a look at a dot. Uh, in VS Code, you just do a dot and this is an empty class and then you do a dot in VS Code and you will see how many methods or how many like default messages are already implemented for an empty class. Okay, it's it's a lot. So Python is not memory efficient and you are using multiple copies of Python. Well, um, well, <laughs> it's just not, not so good. But sometimes, sometimes, sometimes it's still a good idea to do multiprocessing. Okay, so um, again, let me create some graphics. Um, so here um, we have one Python that has one global interpreter lock. Here we have another Python that has another global interpreter lock. And we have a, th a third Python that has another global interpreter lock. And yes, when all 
the process is finished, we can combine the results back together. So in theory, this accomplishes um, parallelism in Python, OK? But the question is, how is data really shared? Right? Remember, these are you can think of these as different programs running at the same time. Every program has their own um, scope, or like just just imagine when the program has the, the, the when you launch the program, the machine will allocate some space to the program. So each program has their own space. So unlike notice threading, right? This is one Python process. Therefore, this is just one one heap. This is just one, some data that is in the same scope. It's in one program. When you are writing one program, I mean, this is everything in that program knows where this piece of data lives. But now, if you if you want to share data, I have this data that lives here. Well, when I create another Python process, how do I access this data? I mean, I can't know where in the me where in memory is this. I mean, I have to look look through the entire memory card to find this data. I mean, that's not really a good way of doing that, right? <laughs> I don't want to look through the entire memory card. So the way Python deals with this is by pickling. And if you are not uh, if you are not familiar, pickling is just Python's way of serializing the data. So what will happen is that the main process will copy this data, will serialize this data, will serialize this data. And just just think of this and let the other process load the, load this piece of data. Okay, this can be done, sure. I mean, most objects can be serialized in Python, right? Um, but again, right, there is a cost to copy this data, this piece of data over to other processes. That's cost. Sometimes it might be expensive. And there's a cost of pickling the data. But this is um, the way that multiprocessing um, shares data. Right, this should be a warning bell because it's copying a lot of stuff. It's launching multiple Pythons and it's copying a lot of stuff. Okay, so what are some mistakes um, when you try to do multi-process? Well, most problems with multi-threading will still be problems for multi-processing. However, because multi-processing has a different model for sharing data, there are, th there are some unique problems to multi-processing. I stumbled upon one such problem a while ago, so I would like to talk about that one. And for that, I will go to the notebook. Okay, so here I am using um, Google BigQuery. If you don't know what it is, it's essentially um, a cloud database. I mean, just just think of this as SQL. Um, and I have a function that gets data from BigQuery. For that, I'm using um, this is Google's library to connect to BigQuery. Um, I'm using that to get to create a client, and this client does a connection for me, and I'm querying some data. Right? I, I can write some queries. Um, and here I'm just showing you, I'm actually hitting the table and I'm actually getting something back. Okay. And here, here we are getting a stock, stock data, stock price data. And let's write a very simple stock analyzer. Right. I mean, okay, sure. And uh, your boss might be like a big OOP, OOP guy. And then your boss is like, hey, write a class for this. And you're like, okay, I'll do it. Um, 
Right, I mean, okay, sorry. If you know me personally, you know I'm not a big fan of OOP, but um, for this example, we do need to do some OOP stuff. Um, here we go. So when we, like, okay, how, how do we do this? How do we write this class? We have an init. Um, have to tell the class where the data lives. It lives in US East WAN region. And then I initiate a client object. I'm going to use this client object to do multiple queries, right? So um, I just need one client object. I don't need many client objects. So I have one client object, and then these are just some very typical methods. Um, and the stock data I'm getting will be ordered by date in the in the descending order, but you, you see here it's unordered, so um, I'm going to order it in a descending order just for convenience. And then let's say I have some crazy stock price um, prediction algorithm, right? It basically looks at yesterday's price and adds some random number to it. Damn, this is so good. Um, and it returns the prediction of the stock price tomorrow, right? And we have a function that calls this crazy algorithm. Right, it just loops over all the stocks. Um, okay, stocks are it, stocks is a dictionary. Um, it's essentially the name and the data and the data frame for this is this. I mean, name is just the ticker of the stock. In the case of Tesla, it's just T S L A, and then data frame is just the uh, related um, stock price data. I'm just going to run this crazy algorithm for every stock in the stocks dictionary here, right? Okay. So this is a basic version of the stock analyzer class and everything is working, right? Um, here I'm querying this data and then here I'm just printing this out. Right, this makes sense, and then I'm running some analysis, which is basically, uh, you know, yesterday's, I mean, the latest dates, close data, um, plus some random number, you know. Now we, we, well, here we only have our stocks. Dictionary has only one thing, which is Tesla stock. But you know, I mean, in reality, it might hold many, many um, stocks together. It might hold many stock price data frames, right? And then we might need to use A, B, C, D, E to predict G, uh, A, B, C, D, E to predict F, right? Or uh, yeah, we might be doing some very crazy stuff on each data frame. And by the way, like this example is by no means the way you should use in um, in reality. This example is just, I created this, this example just to demonstrate the problem that you might face. This is not how you write stock analyzers, okay? This is not how you, li how you write programs like that. <sighs> anyway, so okay. So in the next version, your boss is like, okay, we have too many stock data to analyze, and we have too many predictions that we need to make. It's becoming slow. Can you make this faster? And you're like, hey, yeah, I learned about multiprocessing. Yeah, let, let's just use that, right? Yeah. Okay, so the crazy algorithm is still the same, but I mean, in reality, this can be way more complicated. That's why we want to multiprocess, right? And here, um, the initialization is still the same. We are just creating one client. And I mean, every query, we're just using this client. And potentially, we can um, multi-process this, right? Instead of passing in one query, you can pass in a list of queries. And then we use multi-threading to fetch all the queries. In reality, we can do that. But um, for, for whatever reason, I didn't do that anyway. And now when we actually process the data, we use multi-processing, right? Um, this is the syntax with um, process pull executor. It basically creates a scope for you, and it will automatically join all the processes in the scope. And yeah, so um, 
again, this in this video, I'm not going to talk about syntax. I'm not going to talk about how you use it. You have to kind of trust me in that. <laughs> In, the, in this in this regard you have to trust me <laughs> so here we are creating a list and essentially um, we are looping over our stocks and then for every like name in our stocks we are going to um, you know run this crazy algorithm with this name and we submit this job to the executor and the executor will create the process for it and then it will, you know, um, join the processes for you. And um, the return object for the executor.submit is actually a future object. So that's why I'm calling this list futures because it's a list of futures. And um, as completed just means um, if something is completed, this will loop and then it will wait until the next thing completes and then this will, this will continue looping. All right, and then I'm just getting the result and um, right the the data that I'm getting back is a tuple, is a two tuple, it's a name and the prediction. So I'm putting this into the the first element here in rest is going to be the name, the second element here is going to be the prediction. So I'm putting it in output. Let's take a look. So, I mean, here loading, no problem. We can potentially, uh, as I said, we can potentially pass in a list of tickers, right? Uh, and then we change this function. I mean, we can potentially use multi threading to, you know, launch two threads to fetch the data at the same time, right? We can, we can still use the same clients, no problem, because it's, uh, it's because we are doing multi threading each thread we are sharing the client object between the two threads, so that's no pro there's no problem. Um, but let's run analysis. Let's run the part that we uh, used multiprocessing. We're getting an error, and it's called a pickling error. Pickling client objects is explicitly not supported. Clients have non-trivial state that is local and unpickable. Well, you know, I had no idea what this meant until I realized that multiprocessing is actually using pickles to share data among the processes. Like, Python's error messages are always bad because they don't tell you exactly why something is wrong <laughs> well yeah they don't exactly tell you what is wrong they tell you it's a pickling error but you see like there's so many layers of abstractions in python and then if you're just using multiprocessing like like after watching some videos uh, on youtube you're like hey let, let me try out multiprocessing and then you Let's say you got that error. You had you will have no idea what's happening. So the reason is again, when multi, when there are multiple processes and when you want to share data among the processes, the data needs to be pickled. So let's think about like what is exactly being shared in this case. Well, Every process is going to call self.crazy algorithm. So this is the class method. And it's going to take in name as an argument. So name can potentially be copied with no problem. But what about a class method? Can a class method exist? I mean, can a class method, how can a class method exist in another copy of Python, right? Remember, we defined a class here. In the main, this, let's assume this is the main um, process, right? This is the main process. We define a class here. So, okay, I'm, 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 
I'm using this class method in many processes. So this class better exists here too. And this class better exists here too. However, there is a problem. Well, most classes can be pickled can be pickled that that's good like most class most classes in python can be pickled without a problem but what is the problem here what exactly is the problem here well now you realize oh now this error message kind of makes sense it's saying that client objects is explicitly not supported client object this is an open connection to the internet how can this be serialized right if if this can be serialized then this this open connection can be seriatically passed around and then once you load it in another program this crazy thing should still work but I mean If you know a little more about you know programming you will realize this is an incredibly hard task and often it's impossible if you have an open connection to the internet how can I serialize that data I mean JSON is one way to serialize data and you can load JSON the same JSON file in JavaScript in Python but how can I load a client object uh, how can I load a Python client object in say JavaScript right anyway so th this actually is the problem this in order to multiprocess here because this is a class method the class needs to be pickled but the class contains a client attribute but which cannot be p pickled and that's why we are getting this error and you say okay can we fix it I mean here we need to like pickle the client because client is a class attribute well l let's just make it not a class attribute right so that 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 leads us to the third implementation of the stock analyzer remember we only need to use this client object when we do the query sure now why not just create uh, why not just initialize this object only when we do the query right if we put the client here inside this method then this client is no longer a class attribute it's just a local variable in this function now okay now obviously we don't when we pickle the class we don't need to call we don't need to pickle the client object anymore because in a different Python process I can I can still import this package and that's I will just initialize a client object in the different Python process that's totally fine well the only problem is now whenever you call this query you have to initialize a client object you have to initialize a different client object it's kind of inefficient it's okay it's just kind of inefficient right if the cost of initialization of this client is pretty expensive then if and and if you are calling this function a lot of times then it it's not it's not the best code but but we have to deal with it. we have to live with it now in this case the BigQuery client object is it's okay it's it's pretty fast to initialize but um, just imagine in a more uh, you have a more complex client that you are initializing right so this is not again like I'm not saying which implementation is better than the other no I mean it's it depends on your use case but this should this should bypass the issue here okay let's take a look. Oh, broken process pool. What does this mean? Well, let me copy this code. So 
Notice here I'm running this in Jupyter Notebook, okay? Let me copy this and then um, let me remove the entire thing and paste it. I, I just pasted the entire thing here, okay? Just to prove that this is exactly the same code. And now we are in a Python script. I'm importing the same language, uh, same packages, and using the same query. And I'm, I'm just, um, I should name this three. Right now, the code should be exactly the same as here. Okay. So now let's open a new terminal. Let me first check Python version. Okay, it's the same Python version. And let's run Python Analyzer. It takes some time because I'm doing the querying here too. And then we run the analysis. Oh, no. wait, what the heck? This class, the code for Stock Analyzer 3 is exactly the same as the code here. And we are calling exactly the same thing. But in the in Jupyter Notebook we got an error. And wow. Well, but we don't get an error when it's a Python script. Right? Well it turns out it turns out it turns out this is a problem with Jupyter Notebook and Windows. So I found this um, Stack Overflow page, which is exactly the same problem, pr broken process pool, while running code in Jupyter Notebook. And um, and here, and here is a detailed post explaining how to fix this problem and it turns out it turns out it is a Windows and Jupyter Notebook problem it turns out this is a Windows and Jupyter Notebook problem well so what is the conclusion Well, I don't know. There are just too many problems when you try to multi-thread or multi-process in Python. But sometimes you, you, sometimes I mean, when you want to download a lot of things, you, multi-threading can still make your code much faster. But the use cases are kind of limited, and you know. Multiprocessing is just, you know, sad face. Anyway, so let me conclude with a sad face. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video. See you in the next one.